Welcome to this Wound Club online module on pressure ulcer prevention using the Eskin Care Bundle, which forms part of a series you can access to develop your knowledge and understanding around wound care. Today we will be discussing pressure ulcer prevention and the Eskin Care Bundle, as well as the Asking Educational Framework. You will come across the terms pressure injuries and pressure ulcers, and these can be used interchangeably. However, for the purpose of this presentation, we will use the term pressure ulcer. By the end of the module, you will be able to recognise the importance of pressure ulcer prevention, identify the components of the Eskin Care Bundle and the Asking Educational Framework, understand each element of the Eskin Care Bundle and the Asking Educational Framework. <coughs> It is important to understand what defines an injury or wound as pressure related, therefore correctly diagnosing a pressure ulcer. The cause of any wound is important in the assessment and appropriate planning to facilitate wound healing. Remember that if the wound is not caused by pressure, it should not be documented as a pressure ulcer. Therefore, a pressure ulcer is defined as localised damage to the skin and or underlying tissue. The ulcer is usually over a bony prominence, for example, heels or elbows. The overarching cause of the ulcer will be as a result of intense or prolonged pressure to the area and can be in combination with a shearing force. Firstly, let's look at the burden of pressure ulcers. According to the United Kingdom's National Institute for Health Excellence, NICE, Pressure ulcers are a major burden of sickness and reduce quality of life for people and their caregivers. They are estimated to occur in 4 to 10% of patients admitted to hospitals in the UK and they can be debilitating for the patient. Pressure ulcers can lead to life-threatening complications, severely affecting the patient's quality of life. Therefore, I'm sure you will agree that recognising and understanding more around pressure ulcers will help to improve outcomes for patients. NICE found from death and severe harm incident reporting that pressure ulcers accounted for 19% of all patient safety incidences reported in 2011-2012. And yet we know many pressure ulcers are preventable. With this in mind, NICE recommends use of a validated risk assessment tool to support clinical judgment in identifying those at risk. In pressure ulcer prevention, any patient identified as being at risk of developing a pressure ulcer in either an acute or community setting should have a pressure ulcer prevention care bundle. The implementation of a care bundle approach is recognised as an effective way of translating research into practice with positive outcomes for the patient. The bundle is designed to facilitate consistency in practice. The Eskin model has a five element approach to countering risks of likely pressure ulcer damage. These are surface, skin inspection, keep moving, incontinence and moisture, nutrition and hydration. Pressure ulcers can develop in all age groups and in all care settings, and if not identified early, can develop into significant deep tissue injuries. The use of risk assessments can help identify those patients that require interventions to mitigate the risk of a pressure ulcer developing. So let's go through each of the steps in more detail to find out what each element of the care bundle involves. S. Surfaces is the first element in S-skin and requires consideration of pressure redistribution. This is to manage tissue loads, microclimate and other therapeutic functions. The use of support surfaces is one of the most common interventions for preventing pressure ulcers. These support surfaces can include mattresses, chairs, cushions, foot and heel protection and offloading devices. Consider what equipment you may need to put in place in order to reduce or relieve pressure. Once an appropriate surface has been identified, it should be reassessed in terms of its appropriateness and functionality on every encounter to ensure it is still suitable for the patient's needs. In line with NICE guidance, those identified as high risk of developing pressure ulcers should have a high specification foam mattress or if undergoing surgery, an equivalent pressure redistributing mattress. 
For those at high risk of developing a heel pressure ulcer, offloading should be considered where appropriate. Additional seating needs for patients that are at risk or, or who are sitting for prolonged periods needs to be considered. And for adults who use a wheelchair, consider a high specification foam or an equivalent pressure redistributing cushion. If in a community setting, the carers, family and patients should understand how the equipment works and why it has been implemented. In summary, the key points for surface are support surfaces are a key intervention in pressure ulcer prevention and management. The main use of support surfaces is to redistribute or relieve pressure. There is little evidence to support or guide equipment choice. Equipment selection involves assessing a patient's risk of developing a pressure ulcer. Health professionals need to consider patient preference and where and when the equipment will be used. Skin inspection. Regularly inspecting a patient's skin to identify skin abnormalities is a key practice in pressure ulcer prevention. Basic knowledge of skin anatomy, which has been outlined in previous modules, will be a helpful refresher. Initial skin inspection should identify any broken or moist areas, any areas of excoriation or any pre-existing skin conditions. The key objective is prevention and so a skincare regime should include regular inspection of the skin for signs of damage. The patient's skin should be examined systematically from head to toe. Although pressure ulcers most commonly occur over bony prominences, they can be found under medical devices such as masks or catheters. A patient's consent must be obtained prior to a skin inspection. The acronym BEST SHOT from the Stop the Pressure campaign is a useful reminder of specific areas of the body to check. B, buttocks, E, elbows, ears, S, sacrum, T, trochanters, S, spine, shoulders, H, heels, O, occiput, others, T, toes. Skin should be checked for changes in colour, temperature or texture. In patients with darker skin, redness is not always obvious, so practitioners should look for a change of colour in the surrounding skin. To test for early signs of skin damage, apply light finger pressure to the area for a count of three. If the area becomes white on removal and then returns to red, this is described as blanching and healthy skin. Discoloured patches not turning white when pressed denotes non-blanching erythema, category 1 pressure ulcer. If skin damage has occurred, then the assessment must include the condition of the wound bed, size and shape of wound, location, signs of infection, exudate levels, peri-wound condition, pain and malodor. A body map showing the position of the skin damage as well as a written description and photography is useful to record the size and severity of the damage. Device related pressure ulcers tend to occur as a result of a medical device being used as an essential part of the patient's treatment. They most commonly occur on the face, head and neck. Interventions that may help in order to prevent device-related pressure ulcers include correct positioning and care of the equipment, use of thin hydrocolloids, film dressings or barrier products underneath the device to reduce moisture and friction, or the use of pressure reducing dermal pads. In summary, the key aspects of skin inspection are early inspection equals early detection, full daily skin inspection, educate on early signs of pressure damage and always check for vulnerable areas. Keep moving. This is crucial in pressure ulcer prevention. Regular body movements assist blood flow and help to redistribute pressure. Current guidelines state that all patients at risk of pressure ulcers should be repositioned unless otherwise contraindicated following an individualized schedule. When positioning patients, clinicians should consider an, an, an individual's anatomy as what provides good offloading for one patient may not be effective for all patients. Positioning should maintain the patient's dignity and functional ability as well as comfort. 
Failure to maintain comfort is one of the most common reasons for patients not tolerating positions in which they are placed. All patients should have a repositioning schedule. Patients may need frequent repositioning or it could be every four to six hours. Clinicians will need to use clinical judgment at time of assessment and reassess frequently. Ensure when repositioning that the patient is not repositioned on an existing pressure ulcer or onto medical devices such as tubes and drains. Additionally, it is important to avoid elevation that contributes to pressure and shear on the sacrum and coccyx. In summary, the key aspects for keep moving are get up, get dressed, keep moving, change position every two hours, encourage independent movements. Assessing the patient and identifying skin damage associated with increased moisture, often caused by incontinence, is an essential part of good skin care. Excessive moisture on the skin due to factors such as urinary or faecal incontinence or wound exudate greatly increases the risk of pressure ulcers. Moisture associated skin damage is not a direct cause of pressure ulcers, but its presence contributes to the weakening of the skin and increases friction. Patient assessment will identify the source of the damage and clarify the severity, location and moisture type. With all types of moisture associated skin damage, preventing further skin damage is key. Clinicians need to identify any sites on a patient's skin that are at risk from the presence of moisture and instigate early skin protection using barrier products such as creams or films. A simple neutral pH skin cleanser should be used prior to application of the skin barrier product. As incontinence associated dermatitis often occurs in combination with pressure ulcers, it is vital that clinicians can distinguish between the two. Location, pressure ulcers are usually over bony prominence, whereas incontinence associated dermatitis is generally across a wider area of the buttocks, genitals and inner thighs. Shape, Pressure ulcers tend to be singular and have distinct edges, whereas IAD usually presents as multiple lesions with irregular edges. Depth. Moisture lesions are usually superficial or partial thickness skin loss, whereas a pressure ulcer varies on the amount of tissue damage. Dietary deficiencies are a recognised risk for developing pressure ulcers and guidance recommends using a nutritional screening tool to assess risk factors, including malnutrition. Nutrition and hydration play an important role in keeping the skin healthy. All patients considered at risk of developing a pressure ulcer should have a comprehensive nutritional assessment by a member of the multidisciplinary team. It should include food history and nutritional intake, height and BMI, history of weight loss, blood tests, evidence of muscle wasting, ability to eat independently. The tool that is most commonly used in the UK is MUST. Once the assessment is complete, an individualised plan should be implemented, as well as identifying the amount of nutrition needed. If it is not possible to achieve nutrition through a normal diet, fortified foods or supplements should be considered. So that's the Eskin Care Bundle. What about asking? When developing the core curriculum for pressure ulcers, NHS Improvement felt that two additional elements were needed to be added for the educational framework. Therefore, the educational framework surrounding the Eskin Bundle was expanded to asking, and this included two additional steps for healthcare professionals to consider. A, assessing risk. G, giving information. The reason for conducting a risk assessment is to identify patients at risk of developing pressure ulcers and to assist in planning interventions to reduce risk. Risk should be assessed within six hours of admission to a healthcare setting, at the first face-to-face -face contact in the community setting by clinical staff or on a change of condition or circumstance. Risk should always be reassessed when the care setting changes. NICE suggests risk assessments should be considered on clinical judgment and or use of a validated tool.
There are many pressure ulcer risk tools in use today. Examples include Waterloo, Braden and Purpose T. A key element of assessing the pressure ulcer risk is a clear, thorough and timely documentation of the risk. Regular reassessment should take place as per local protocols. Not all patients will agree with their risk assessment and plan of care. It is therefore important to discuss the consequences with the patient and family and document precisely the steps taken and escalate any concerns. Communication issues commonly feature in root cause analysis of pressure ulcer incidents. Information may be given to patients and carers verbally or in a more structured way such as through leaflets, videos or apps. However you are given the information, it should be clear, concise, focus on clear messages, use everyday language and be aimed at the recipient's level of learning. Communication with the multidisciplinary team must be factual and convey the relevant information and level of importance or urgency. Prevention and management of pressure ulcers depends on effective communication between different members of the multidisciplinary team. So to recap, ESKIN is a five-step care bundle and asking is the educational framework around it to prevent and treat pressure ulcers. The main aims of ESKIN are to reduce pressure, shear and friction using a suitable support surface, inspect and assess skin regularly, optimise movement, optimise skin moisture levels, promote adequate nutrition and hydration. The ESKIN bundle is a widely used tool that helps clinicians communicate with the multidisciplinary team and with patients and carers to help them understand the risk of developing a pressure ulcer. To check your knowledge and understanding, try and answer the quiz questions. Well done, you are now at the end of the module. Take the time to reflect on how you would take some of what you have learned and apply it to your daily practice. It might be useful to think of some patients in your care and reflect on their skin care and how you might manage this going forward. If you are on the NMC register, then please click on the link in the description below to access a copy of the revalidation forms, which allows for deeper reflection. Adding to this reflection will mean you are able to claim extra CPD minutes. Thank you for your time today. Please remember to look at the other sections of the Smith & Nephew channel to access additional modules to help you on your learning journey.